you for, for coming. Uh, this is sort of toward the tail end of our Media Economics and Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. Uh, throughout the semester, we've had, uh, on the journalism side of this, we've had uh, sort of a, a, a long, basically, sort of discussion about the future of the news industry from the perspective of uh, industry analysts, from investors, and here today, I'm very pleased that we actually have someone who is a successful news entrepreneur. Uh, I met Charlie uh, many years ago when we both worked for uh, Old Line Legacy Media Newspapers. Uh, and I think that Charlie might say that you know he uh, might seem in many ways like an unlikely candidate to blaze sort of a new trail in the news industry by starting a business. Uh, and also in particular starting a business precisely in the field that everybody said was doomed to failure. Sort of quality international reporting that holds itself to high standards. <laughs> The, the sort of very thing that everybody was already lamenting the demise of uh, when Charlie was starting his business, and uh, now I think he's proven a lot of people wrong, and I think also uh, shown a way for many others in the industry to go forward. So, uh, without further ado, I want to uh, hand it over to Charlie Sennett, who's going to tell us about uh, Global Post. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And better to speak from here. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I love being here. I did fly in late last night, and I'm a little jet lagged. <laughs> but the coffee is definitely starting to break through. And um, I just wanted to say um, what's going on at the school is really exciting. I, I've, I've been following from afar uh, through Gabe and through Diane some of the classes you have, some of the approaches you have. And um, I'm really impressed. So it's, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe, for the nice introduction. It's a long time since 1993, Manhattan. Um, and I wanted to, at, at Gabe's request, uh, he asked me to think about trying to go through how I got into uh, the business and how basically try to rip through my career so that you get a sense of, of just how old school I am. And as Gabe very well put it, how unlikely a candidate to start a digital uh, news organization uh, that's really seen um, you know, as pioneering right now. So it's too hard to put your coffee on anything here. I better put it down here. But you can hear me the same as if I'm here as if I'm there, correct? OK. <clears throat> so the, the career path for me was a career path that is really old school very old school. Uh, my family had a house painting business. My older brother worked nights at the Boston Herald as a photographer. In the rookie year of Larry Bird's first year, I'm sure many of you don't know Larry Bird, but some of you would know because he was Magic Johnson's good friend. Um, <laughs> It was the most amazing year for the Boston Celtics. And it was, here's this rookie who's come in. And, and I was a young you know, uh, high school student. And my older brother had this great job at night shooting the Celtics. And this is so long ago that he actually used to have to hand me the film. And I would run the film down and out to a driver who would get it back to the paper. And uh, I literally was courtside of what I really cared about, which is the Celtics. And uh, that experience of being courtside, of seeing it, of, you know, my brother handed me the film and I'm like still watching the game and he's saying, go get the film back, man, was really what drew me to wanting to be um, courtside as a journalist. And, and I, you know, also my brother worked for the Boston Herald. And how many of you are from Boston or know Boston or know the Herald? Herald's an old school, mischievous tabloid, gritty newspaper. And the culture that I saw there, I sort of fell in love with. Uh, it was the last days of great newspaper wars. Um, you know, crusty old city editor who, when I'd be waiting for my brother to drive me home, would like look at me, and I was about 18. His drinking age was 18 then. And he'd say, uh, hey, kid, you want a drink? And I'd say, sure. And he leaned back to this um, first aid kit on the wall. He opened the first aid kit, and there's a bottle of vodka in there. And it was that kind of newsroom. And it was like a romance to it. I loved it. So, so I ended up deciding I really, really young. I mean, in high school, I really wanted to do this. Um, 
first went into uh, to college, I went to, into radio. I got really interested in radio, and I worked for a NPR member station, um, WFCR in Amherst. And I worked there for a short while, and then got a job um, uh, basically writing for, for the university publications. And I really preferred writing to radio, and I went from that into the Columbia School of Journalism, that other journalism school, the other coast. And I had it, um, uh, you know, that's all pretty traditional. Went to the Bergen Record right out of the J School, from the Bergen Record to the New York Daily News. Finally was in Manhattan in the New York Daily News. But all along the way, in the Bergen Record and, and uh, at the New York Daily News, I was really interested in doing international reporting. So even as a local reporter, I was looking to do foreign stories. The way that would avail itself was, for example, in, in New Jersey, in Hackensack. Um, you'd have uh, stories that were all around you that were about the world. And for me, one that really interested me was there was this huge pipeline of Irish immigration coming over at that point. The jobs weren't in Ireland. They were in the States. We all know that story. But it interests me. And we found out that there was this entire uh, Gaelic football team from a little town called Kilmac Thomas that had the entire team had moved to this little town in New Jersey. Talked the editor into letting me go to Ireland to cover the town, the little tiny town of Kilmac Thomas that lost its whole team and what that did to the community. And you know, as a way to look at the pipelines of immigration and the, and the history of the Irish people coming to the United States, you could really open the story up. Um, you know, I, I would be covering a planning board and I would hear about at a uh, Cuban um, sandwich shop one day, I heard that they were training, uh, a bunch of conservative Cubans were training to go to something called Camp Oliver North. The only words I heard were Camp Oliver North. <laughs> and I know I got to get to that planning board meeting, but that interests me. And so I start to meet these guys, and I end up being taken in by them and end up actually writing about this group of conservative Cubans who want to go fight alongside the Contras in the war in Nicaragua. And I end up actually following them. And they were sort of classically Cuban. They were very secretive. They'd ask me questions like, what do you think about what we're doing? And I'd say, I think there are no words for it. <laughs> and uh, so they trust me, uh, and they sort of bring me in. And then we take me out to their secret training camp. And they literally blindfold me, throw me in the back of this van. We drive for two hours, and they let me out in the secret training camp. And across the street is the Bordentown Elementary School. <laughs> I knew exactly where I was. That was a big story, and we broke it, right? We broke it with the dateline. We knew where it was. We did the whole thing. They weren't too happy with me the next day. Um, and Torricelli comes in, congressman comes in, does a whole investigation of the Neutrality Act. Next thing I know, they're saying, my editor's saying to me, go... We want you to go to Nicaragua. We want you to follow these guys. Some of them are already there. Go find them. Finally, get a job in New York City at the New York Daily News. And I'm thinking the same way. You know, I loved being a street reporter. I loved covering cops. I loved covering courts. But New York City is all about the world. And there were so many stories that could take me from a local police reporting story out to the world. Classic example was uh, when, Carl when uh, Galan, the presidential candidate in Colombia, was assassinated. I was in a bar called McGuire's, which was directly across from the Daily News. And the city editor at the time, John Cotter, knew I spoke Spanish. And he uh, basically said, uh, watching television out of one corner of the eye and a sort of body, you know, tabloid newspaper war bar banter going on here. And he's watching this, and everyone's talking. And he just suddenly interrupts everything. And he goes, hey, Senate, you have a passport? And I said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, go to Columbia. He reaches over to the bartender. He says, Jimmy, give me $2,000. Jimmy hands him $2,000. He hands me the money, and he says, go to Columbia. And that was a foreign assignment. <laughs> um, so I, I really have always wanted to be a foreign correspondent and had that traditional path, but I never stopped thinking about doing foreign reporting. And in 1993, right around the time that I had met Gabe, there was a Lower Manhattan, loud bang. I'm downtown. Hear this bang, hear a lot of sirens. I look around, see smoke. So, someone once said that's like the definition of a foreign correspondent. You walk in that direction everyone else is running from, where you see your good friends and you start doing your work. 
walk toward the smoke, walk into the smoke, and see that there are people uh, coming out of the World Trade Center. And smoke is flowing out of the World Trade Center parking lot, uh, parking garage. And we get past it, and we get in there, and they finally put on some emergency lighting, and bang, there's a five-story deep crater. We all thought it was a generator explosion, a fire. No one was thinking terrorism in 1993. But when you saw that crater, you know, live through the smoke, courtside, uh, I realized, you know, it's a bomb. This is, this is a huge story. Someone tried to blow up the World Trade Center. Um, what I didn't know was I would then be covering nascent Al-Qaeda for the rest of my life until today. I just got back from Egypt from Tahrir Square. That feels like a continuation of that police reporting story that I did in 1993. City editor, Daily News, said to me, you got a passport, right? <laughs> go, you know, go to the West Bank, where these guys were from. Bless you. <laughs> go to the West Bank. Follow the perps, as they would call them in the parlance of New York City police reporting, perpetrators. So I followed them. And uh, you know, it really wasn't prescient. That's, that's not why I tell the story. Because like New York City shrugged off that bombing, six people were killed. Six people die every day in New York City, murdered every day in New York City. What interests me was that it began a journey of covering a story from a local police story to getting out in the world and covering it. But I also knew I really now wanted to cover this. I ended up in Egypt, where Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman was from. I ended up in West Bank, where the loser who went for his his deposit back on the rental truck. Remember this guy? Zalameh. Mohammed Zalameh, a classic Palestinian guy who rents the rider truck that they put the bomb in. And then he goes back to Ryder to get his refund. <laughs> and they arrested him. You knew then that's probably not the mastermind. <laughs> so we're looking for the mastermind. Ramzi Youssef, Pakistani. That's interesting. So it starts to revolve around the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. This is nascent Al-Qaeda. This is 1993. This is police reporting. This is classic New York City police reporting, following the story, getting out, looking at, at a crime that was committed in Lower Manhattan. But I stayed out a little too long that time, and I realized I really want to do this. I want to be in the Middle East. And as it turned out, the uh, managing editor of the Daily News, Matt Storen, went to the Boston Globe, where he had been before. He knew that I was from Boston, always wanted to work at the Globe. And what was his lure to get me to come to the Globe, or what was my great desire to get to the Globe? It was that they had foreign bureaus. Not only that they were a great newspaper, but that they had foreign bureaus and I could get a foreign posting. I could get the Middle East posting, which is exactly what I wanted. And he said, you come, you do well for a few years, you get that. And I, he lived up to it. He stuck to his word. So in 1997, I was named Middle East Bureau Chief, which my wife always found very humorous, since I was the only correspondent in the Middle East for the Boston Globe. <laughs> and she would often say, I had this tiny little cubicle office for the Boston Globe Bureau in the Middle East. And she'd call me. We have, we have but all during these years, we're having all these kids born. We have four boys. So it's like, <laughs> these are insane years. And she'd be really busy at home, and I'd be really busy at work. She'd say, am I interrupting you in a meeting with all your personalities? <laughs> Mr. Bureau Chief? Um, so, you know, it was a, a classic path that existed then, and it no longer exists now. That's the, that's the sad part. You become a cop reporter, you climb up in the newspapers, you get to a newspaper with foreign bureaus, you go over and you get the foreign gig. I had it for four years in the Middle East. It happened to coincide with the Intifada, with 9-11. I then go on to London because it started to get a little too hot with little kids in Jerusalem. We get to London. I spend most of my time in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's a big time. I've covered this story since 1993. So some of that's just the trajectory of history, being on a story, timing, all those issues. But I want to really quickly turn the corner and say that that traditional career path for me may not exist anymore, but there are new paths. And this is really and genuinely the most exciting time to be in the field of journalism. This is a time of revolution. This is a time when you can go out and create your own path in an extraordinary way, in a way that I never could have 
when I was at the Bergen Record trying to hustle my editors to let me go abroad. You can do it differently, but you're going to have to be entrepreneurial in the way you report. You know, I realized I'm an entrepreneur when my editors would always wonder how I hustled them to get them on these great assignments. You're always an entrepreneur when you're a journalist. You're always selling the story. You're always looking for the opportunity to go out and tell that story. So use your entrepreneurial skill. Use the new technology that is available to you. Connect it with your passion for what you want to do. For me, it was foreign reporting. If it's global health for you, if it's business, if it's local reporting, and you want to find a way to really dig down on local news, and you find a very interesting way to use the technology that is available, and you can talk your, your, uh, your employer, or you can create your own website if you can get some business models together, and you have a good friend who's a good accountant and a good businessman, you can do it. Um, so this is not a tale of a time that's over. It's really about my journey and the things that got me through our passion and being an entrepreneur and just loving the work in the field. If you have that, this is, this is your moment. This is the time to really, I think, do great work. So we can get into more detail on that. Gabe also asked me to talk a little bit about the start of Global Post. How, do we, how does a, a sort of dinosaur like me, and literally my, my son Gabriel, who was born in Bethlehem, it gets a little heavy. <laughs> um, uh, he, uh, he was actually literally born in Bethlehem. He, um, he's this wild little kid, really funny, and uh, just so interesting. He's always making little things, but he once heard me call the dinosaur on television. Like, I was on the BBC, and they were talking about print media dinosaurs. And he had this thing about dinosaurs at that time. He was that age, you know? So what I love is I would go off to Afghanistan. I'd be off to Iraq, and he'd always plant little dinosaurs in the most unbelievably, like, interesting places, you know? Like in my flak jacket. <laughs> like in my pockets of my coat that he knew I'd wear, inside my sleeping bag, and all these little dinosaurs, and I, I, I've kept them all. They're like uh, my own little collection. And you know, um, the thing is, even in this new age, this digital age of journalism, the people with the skills for storytelling, the people who love journalism, uh, have, I think, a huge opportunity. And I don't think you're a dinosaur at all if you're of that age. And I think if you're a young person, don't be so confident in your digital skills until you learn more about storytelling. I have come across a lot of people who can do a lot of great things for us on the web, and they have a long way to go to understand what it is to be out there, to know what it is to be a foreign correspondent, to know what it is to how to tell a story, how to connect people to it, how to find it, how to dig down and get that story. So, if you're young, don't be too cocky. You're not that great. You've got a lot to learn. <laughs> and if you are a veteran, um, you know, listen to younger people. Work with them. You can, you can learn so much. I mean, I learn every day from the people on our staff who are, who are constantly coming up with new ideas that we hadn't thought of. And I'll share some of those with you on the site. But it, what happened to me was 10 years as a foreign correspondent, really heavy 9-11 coverage, Afghanistan and Iraq, 8 out of 12 months a year for, for more years than I want to admit, really away from my very large family a lot. So I got this sort of year of, of recovery, the year of living comfortably, I call it, <laughs> uh, for foreign correspondents, which is called the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard <coughs> University. And my whole family is taken to Harvard University. We arrive after all this bang bang and all this chaos. And I, we had a really great year of being together. Of it, I think we really got to capture the, uh, the spirit of what the Neiman Fellowship is supposed to be about, which is reflection. You know, I had a book that I really wanted to write. Bob Giles, the curator of the Neiman, said, I'm going to really recommend you don't. And it was the greatest advice. I could have done another book, cranked out another book. That would have been great. He said, just take a year to think about where you want to go. I mean, that's, I, you know, that is what fellowship's all about. That's what universities can provide, that step back. Had that opportunity. And in that year, it really was, it was 2005 to 2006. And if you did a sort of thermal mapping of the crisis point 
in American journalism when it became apparent that newspapers are going to be in a lot of trouble. It's that year. And all of us in our Neiman year, we're having this great year, but we're wondering, like, you know, some, some were literally wondering, do they have a job when they go back? Everyone was in this tumult of the new media. What does it mean? And we had a lot of discussions about it. And I thought, you know, I want to go back and try to work in multimedia at the Globe, try to work on digital platforms, see if they'll let me do, you know, I didn't know a lot about it, but I wanted to try it. And they gave me some opportunities to do that. I worked with a great photographer. We did a trip to Afghanistan where we did a big multimedia extravaganza with what seemed so complicated at the time, an audio slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just like I used to work in radio. I love sound. I was the audio man. I, I love working with audio. I think audio is one of the most important things on the web. Because if you don't have good audio, you can't get people to really follow what you have. So I did the audio. He did the photography. We put them together. We told a story of a journey. I still look back at this, really, it's like it's prehistoric. But the basic elements are there, which is tell a story, storytelling. Uh, um, but it also became apparent that the Globe wasn't going to be sending me on many foreign trips anymore. And that was becoming less and less clear. Um, that idea that I really wanted to go do the Beijing Bureau, they kept sort of putting me off on that. Um, within, within eight months, the Globe had done what it really regretted to do, but it had to do because of the economy, which is they shut down their entire foreign operation. No more foreign correspondence, no foreign editor. The whole operation, not quite overnight, but pretty close, was shut down. This was hard for a newspaper that is a great newspaper, still a great newspaper. Um, the economic models just didn't allow them to aspire to do foreign reporting anymore. They still are great, and they still do great journalism. They're just not going to do that anymore. And that's probably a, a smart economic decision for them. That was 2007. 2007, I begin to say, OK, then maybe what I need to do is be entrepreneurial on my own. And I began to think through and how I could create an international news organization on my own. How could you create something where you could actually pull people together? I had like, there are only a hundred foreign correspondents or so connected to American news organizations. I mean, it's not that many. I knew 50 of them. And 30 of them were out of work. So I'm thinking, well, what, how do you take how do you take that great talent and maybe build a team, maybe start all over? How do you do this? So I did what every journalist who did poorly on their math SATs and never went to business school. Any of us who are in journalism never went to business school. If you did, Gabe, I don't know. I don't think you learned the lessons well. We did, I did what I think is the easiest thing in the world to do. And I just said, aha, we'll do a nonprofit. That's it. Just get a lot of rich people to give us money, and we'll go out and do great journalism. <laughs> so I started trying to cook this thing, and I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm doing, talking to the Carnegie Foundation. I'm talking to Knight, like everybody's talking to Knight, the Knight Foundation. And um, anyway, I, I, I did a lot of grants, and I started to cobble together the possibility of about five hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot, you know, that's a lot of money. But what, what can you really do with that? What, what could you really accomplish with that? What could you create? And while I'm thinking this through, we have this big falling apart old house out in the rural climbs of outside of Boston. I'm hearing four boys pounding on the floorboards above me thinking, I got four kids to put through college. There's, there is no way I can do this. And I worry, a uh, separate conversation, and I have five minutes left. So, but I do just want to throw in something. Maybe we could talk about it. I do worry about a sort of privileged class that may be able to afford to do journalism these days. I am not from that class. And I had to come up with a way that I could really do it, or I'm going to stay and go down with the ship at the Globe. And I love local reporting. I love Boston. I love the city. I would have no problem doing that. It, it wasn't going to be the end of the world to stay with a great newspaper that shifts away. But I knew this is what I do. I love being a foreign correspondent, and I want to keep doing it. So as I'm putting together my little model and I've got my you know, 
$500,000 and I could get like this partnership and I could get that and I got these 10 or 15 really you know, superstar foreign correspondents who want to do this with me. And they're all looking at me like, are you going to really be able to do this? Because like we need work, man. And you know, I started to try to put it together and literally put together a board of advisors and didn't realize if you were doing a doc, like a, a sort of cheesy film on this made for TV, you'd have a split screen. And I would be doing that. What I didn't realize was there was a real businessman, a real um, you know, person who understands how to build a business who had a similar idea. And he is from Boston. And we knew each other. What we didn't know was we were cooking the same idea until we started to form a board and much of the boards overlapped. And they said, you guys should talk. And that is Phil Balboni, who is the CEO of Global Post and who is the founder of New England Cable News. And these become almost a sort of, um, it's, like a, it's like, a, like, like a, a machine in which the cogs come together because Phil had, had a great love for international news but had always done local reporting and had become you know, a really pioneering executive in local television, nationally known for his work in local television, but not the international connections. I had only done international reporting. I'd been out in the field. That was my passion. I had the connections with the team out there. I knew who, who's good, who isn't. I knew how we could build a team. And at some point, the board said, get together, and we did. And we began to really take his business plan, which made sense, and had a plan for capitalization, and my idea of a team, and put it together. So we did it. Phil came in with the heavy capitalization. I helped out with a little bit of the capitalization. I found very quickly that those wealthy people who I had been talking with would much rather invest in a business that might make them money <laughs> than a nonprofit where they're just going to help us get something done. Note to self, right? It's, it's not a sin to want to make this thing profitable because it, we're going to need to be profitable and self-sustaining if we're going to do great journalism. The greatest journalism in the world has been done by great families that had businesses. Families like the Taylor family at the Boston Globe. They owned it for 120 years before they sold it to the New York Times at the height of the market. The Taylors are now one of our investors. And I'm really proud of that. I mean, that's, that's a great honor for us to have a family like that investing in us. The other investors all care about what we do, but they build long-term businesses. So we don't have any venture capital money. We have people who believe in our mission and who think this is a good idea. Capital was key. So now we got capital, we got a, an idea, and we run out and build the team. And to do that, I literally flew around the world. I knew everybody in the Middle East. I had Latin America. What I didn't have was Asia, and I, and I had to really get out there. So I took a journey through Asia, uh, a little bit through Europe, and I basically flew around the world and hired a whole bunch of freelancers, essentially. We began to build a freelance network. So that was in April of 2008 that we started, three years ago, almost to the day. What's the date? The sixth. So this, I believe it's the 7th. April 7th, I believe, was the day we started in this little, you ever see the movie Boiler Room? Yeah. You know, with the, like the room with all the empty phones? That's how we started. Um, and then uh, built the team, had the capitalization, about 80% of it in place. We go forward. We start to really hire vendors. How are we going to design the site? We get all that up, cranked up. We, we get about 70 freelancers lined up in 50 countries. And we approach January of 2009 when we want to launch. We wanted to launch ahead of uh, President Obama's inauguration. Felt like a new presidency, a new time in America where there's going to be a White House that reaches out to the world in a different way. And that really you know, felt like a moment that was worth trying to capture. So how, how would foreign policy change? It made sense. So we pushed really hard. We launched uh, January, just before the inauguration. And you know, when, you, when you launch, it was like this moment of, in the dead of night, in Boston, freezing cold. I'm looking out. Our, our offices are gorgeous. They're right on the waterfront. And looking out. And I'm on the phone with the tech guy who's, who's in Wisconsin, who's building the site. And he said, OK, you're live. And there's like snow falling into the ocean. It's pitch black. And I'm thinking, that's exciting. 
it's like just, just literally this drop, this silent drop into the ocean of the web. And you're like, well, what's this thing going to do? You know, what's going to happen? You know? So the site is propagating. All the content we'd lined up is starting to flow. It's going to take a day for it to flush out the site. We will be live tomorrow. And I'm thinking, what's this going to mean? So what it's meant is it's been a hell of a ride. It's been a lot of fun. It's been um, hard work. I have never worked harder in my life. Um, it's been a lot of using every skill set you have, right? And, and some people have some skills and some people have other skills. But everyone's got to come together to make it happen. And it's like a barn raising. So three years down the road, we now have uh, 2.5 million unique visitors per month on the site. That's a big number for us. Our, our traffic is growing in ways that we're really happy with. Our investors are really happy. We have, we have fewer correspondents because we realized we had too many. We had too many who were paid too little. We decided to go less you know, is, can be more. And we decided let's have fewer stories, fewer correspondents, pay them more, get better quality, and actually have stories that can, can have more impact. So we recently recalibrated the site in, this, uh, in the fall to reflect that, to go for a little bit more consistency of coverage, a little bit more depth. It turned out to be a very wise move. We also redesigned. I don't know, how many of you remember the old design of Global Post? I don't know if, I mean, how many of you have even been on Global Post? I should ask. So how, OK. Did you notice we redesigned? About three months ago, we did a redesign. And we really rethought the navigation. We got away from regional navigation. That is not how people think on the web. So here I am with the dinosaur in my pocket, you know, thinking regionally. This is not the way to think. So we, we reworked it. It's been successful. It's helped our traffic go up. We also have a lot of, uh, we've been very active with Facebook and with building our community. And we're, we're you know, at about 100, and I've lost track, 130,000, 140,000 um, Facebook fans right now. And that puts us in the top 10 news organizations in the world for Facebook community. It's not that big a community, right? But we're really working at it, and we're way up there with the big guys. We're up there you know, with, with um, uh, news organizations like the Financial Times or like uh, The Economist on that level of engagement, uh, like big newspapers that, that uh, are very large compared to us. We've, we've done everything we could to try to build the business. We've developed three revenue streams, which I'll get into in the Q&A. Uh, they're kind of obvious. Online advertising is one. Syndication is another. So our partnerships are key. We have a partnership with CBS News. We have a partnership with PBS uh, through NPR.org and through the NewsHour. We have about, about 20 publications that uh, syndicate with us. And they range, very eclectic mix, they range from huge newspapers like the Times of India, three million circulation, to great, gritty American newspapers like the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, to small international newspapers like the Cambodia Daily News. Um, and all of these people, for different reasons, have seen value in buying Global Post in a syndication package and having a connection with us. Um, third one, third revenue stream is membership. And I want to ask all of you, click on membership, look at it, see what you think about it. Um, give it a try. It's cheap. It's $2.95 for a month. And you can um, experiment with hearing our correspondents talk live via Skype. The last thing I'm going to talk about, I think we won't do the film because we don't have time. Sure. But, but I just wanted to mention that I, we're at three years. And for me personally, um, when you are an entrepreneur and you're in this digital space, I think it's really important to know what is your strength. And, and I think my strength and my passion is to be in the field. So I've been talking with our CEO as we go into our fourth year about having me do that more. And he, he wants me to get out there to do that as well. And I had an opportunity to go interview General Petraeus. So it was like a big get. We go do the interview in Afghanistan. And while I'm in Afghanistan, back in the field again. This is in January. I'm going to the airport and I see the worst thing you can ever have when you have a big exclusive interview is that you are totally in the wrong place. And the, there's a huge news story ripping somewhere else. And your interview, as important as it is, is probably not going to matter that much. And it was January 25th. 
as Egypt is just starting to explode. I land in Dubai, and I have one of those airport moments as a foreign correspondent. I had interviewed General Petraeus five times before. This was a big interview for us. I cannot not be there. You can't cancel this, but I really should be going to Egypt. I went. We have a very talented young correspondent in Egypt, John Jensen. So we got that covered, and he will, he will begin to cover this in his own way. And he did a fantastic job, he really did. I went to Afghanistan and did my interview. About five days into Afghanistan, I get a phone call from Frontline. I get an email from Frontline. And uh, David Fanning, with whom we had been speaking about trying to do a partnership, had said, would you like, to, he and his team, Rainey and David, these two amazing heads of Frontline. I mean, I really learned a great amount of respect for Frontline. They are, how many of you, you all know Frontline, yes? Everybody would know Frontline. Their reputation is so well-deserved. They work incredibly hard. But what I didn't realize was they also want to work really fast. They say, can you get to Egypt tomorrow? And I said, absolutely. We get to Egypt and begin to work on a, on a half-hour segment in Egypt that is something that made me realize that's what I bring to Global Post. You know, We've built the team, and the team loves the field. If I love the field, I've got to get back to the field, too, and make that part of my job and make it a part of what we do. And I just share that with you because Gabe wanted me to talk about the entrepreneurial spirit. And I think part of the entrepreneurial spirit is to realize your strengths and rely on your team for their strengths. And so I'll end it with that. We were going to show a clip, but I think we won't in the interest of questions. But you can we, check we, it out. We can embed it on uh, video uh, of this event, and there'll be a story on that, too. Uh, we want to have some time for questions now, and also uh, if we run over on time and you want to has, uh, ask uh, Charlie some more stuff, we're going to move out into the hall at 1 o'clock and we have to get out of here. Um, so I want to open it up for questions, but of course I want to hog that because I want to ask the first question. Sure. Which is, <laughs> tell me about the scope of this organization. How, what are your revenues at this point? How quickly have they grown? How yep. quickly do you anticipate them growing? And what do you pay these people in the field? Uh, okay, I'm not going to answer any of those. Anybody else? <laughs> um, no, we have, we, uh, I'll tell you the things that, that, that we share. We're a private company, right? Um, but we're not that private that we don't want to tell people what we're doing. We're, we were capitalized uh, at $10 million, which gave us three years to become profitable. The... Uh, collapse of the global economy was not something we'd predicted. On the other hand, we were really lucky to have, um, to have raised the capital before that happened. And have a business um, leader in, in our CEO who, who, who moved quickly on the idea. I mean, he didn't delay. He pursued, got the money lined up, went for it. I mean, we made it by a matter of like a few months. Um, that is uh, fateful, because we are doing very well given the economic conditions. But our business plan has been modified in terms of reaching profitability at year three. We, we are confident we will be reaching that magic moment of being self-sustaining next year. So you can kind of do the math on what that would mean in terms of our advertising revenue, et cetera. But one of the things I will share with you is the quality of our, of our advertisers. If you go on the site, you'll see Bank of America. You'll see Liberty Mutual. You'll see Xerox and a new uh, sponsored content module we did within the site, clearly marked as sponsored content. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very innovative model about innovation. And it, it is uh, a series of stories about innovation around the world. We're getting um, high-end advertising, I think because they, we're getting a lot of buzz in the industry. And so I think people are taking a chance with us and saying, this is, this is an organization that has quality content. It's a different kind of play. And they're, you know, our 2.5 million uniques per month puts us in the zone to at least be considered. We're small, but at least we're in the realm now. And so we're confident we can get that advertising revenue up. We're confident our syndication partnerships are really important to us, and we're going to go forward. Membership, tough nut to crack. We're still working on it. But that's why I really want you to go on it. I want you to check it out. Take a chance on it. Try to sign up. 
I'm not trying to get 295 in the till here as much as say, here is a school that can help us think through how we do this. So troubleshoot for us. Um, let us know what are the strengths and weaknesses, and we'd love to hear it. I want to I add one thing, which I mentioned to you, too, and, and that is we have a new initiative underway, which, which, um, which I'm really happy to be heading up and I'm really excited about, and that is a new uh, nonprofit initiative at Global Post, right? Remember I was going to start there? Well, now we've built a publishing platform that is on its way to being self-sustaining. We're too young a news organization to do big investigative reporting or to do sort of the high-end enterprise reporting that's very expensive, like Kosovo's Mafia. This is a three-part series, two months investigation in Pristina by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter named Matt McAllister, who knows more about Kosovo and Pristina than any person I know in America. And he is a fantastic reporter who did a really great piece of work. That work is funded by this new nonprofit initiative. The Galloway Family Foundation gave us uh, enough money for him to be able to really go do it. So what do we pay our correspondents? We pay the classic freelance fees that every big newspaper pays to <coughs> correspondents in the field. And it's not much. It's not enough. I mean, we, you know, but the economy of it is 800 word story, somewhere between 250 and $500. There's different ranges depending on your deal. What we do is we give freelancers a commitment. So like at the Wall Street Journal or at the Boston Globe, super stringers had a commitment, a retainer. So we say, okay, here's your retainer. We'll give you a guaranteed four stories a month from Paris or from Prague or from Egypt, which turned out, thank God, we had a very talented 26-year-old reporter named John Jensen, whose father was a diplomat who's fluent in Arabic, went to um, American University Cairo and lived on Tahrir Square. That's <laughs> a gold mine. Now, John Jensen now made a lot more in that time frame because his, his output went way up. But what we, what we didn't have time to do was to sort of give John the equipment he needs, the opportunities he might need to even go further. He did a great job. He did a, a really amazing job, actually, uh, capturing video, writing great stories, really covering the story like a multimedia journalist. But it was this effort toward a partnership with Frontline that really allowed uh, me to work with their team. And these are the best people in the world at documentaries, I, for, for my money. And that's where we want to go. We want to get to that excellence, but we can't afford it every time. So the nonprofit initiative is a new sort of stream. I don't think you'd call it revenue as much as you would resources. <coughs> we want to bring new resources in to do great journalism. And we've recently landed some pretty good grants to do that. And we're just building that team, and we're just going forward. And our goal is to do, in this special reports realm, one big investigative or enterprise piece a month get our great correspondents an opportunity to really dig down and make more money. You know, you need more money to be able to go deep. Provide that resource and have the site combined with freelance work that's a quick daily, but also long-term investigative. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for questions here uh, from folks in the audience, please. Uh, yes. Now that you've been through this startup phase, what's in your mind's eye about where this goes. Uh -huh. what, what does Global Post become? Is, yeah. You're clearly just getting your legs. Yes. What's the, you know, 10 years from now, are you, what are you? I think 10 years from now, I hope people look back and say, it's amazing they got in that when they did. Because <laughs> how was it possible that two guys in Boston, not New York or Washington or LA, two guys in Boston who started something. One guy was a good businessman in Boston, but really local television. And that other guy was just a foreign correspondent. He didn't know anything about business. But if you take those two skill sets and you combine them and you say, OK, did you hit the right moment? And I think we did. I hope 10 years from now, what they'll say is, it's amazing where it started and look where it is now. That idea of trying to achieve excellence they started it with a nonprofit initiative on top of a self-sustaining publishing model. 
Now they're fully self-sustaining. They're very profitable, yet they're still doing that great work. And they're no longer putting their hand out for that nonprofit foundation money. They're doing it on their own. That's what I hope in 10 years. I think in reality, I think we won't even know what the web looks like. It'll be so different. I think, I think what's happening with, with mobile technology, with iPad, with tablets, I think it's about to explode again. So I think the monetization, I think the way we think through content, the way we think through how to do what I care about, which is really in-depth reporting, what I call environments of understanding. And I think the iPad opens that possibility in ways that, you know, when you're at your, your desktop or your laptop, it's just not the same. You're still dealing with keyboard screen and you're, you're interacting in a pretty clumsy way. When you, when you go into the iPad, I think you really start being able to be much more fluid with video, photography, the written word. For people like me who are going blind, I can, I can <laughs> pop that screen so I can really read it. Um, I think I'm, you know, I'm really excited about that. I think, I think it's going to change so dramatically that I don't know where we'll be, but I know one thing. We'll be successful if we're still great storytellers. If we still go out there in the world and bring home the stories that need to be understood here, and we do it the best we can within the technology as it's emerging, and we become a sort of signature brand for storytelling in the world, I think we'll be successful. So where's your iPad at? Good question. That, that revenue stream needs to grow a little bit. If we're going to go have a redesign and a new iPad app. I mean, we have, we have a very primitive iPad application. You can get Global Post on your iPad. And you know, I actually really like it. I don't know if you've seen it. I think it's very simple. But I'm looking at it thinking, this is an easy way to read the site. And OK, it cost us virtually nothing to build. It was very modest investment. Um, but it got, us, it got us on there and we're there. Now I'm hoping with the special reports, if we can get the right funder, we can now begin to say to Knight or to whoever, we need money to take this great team and start to get them really to think through the different levels of um, working across <coughs> platforms. And you know, my hope is to use that money and that aspiration to really bring it in a new way. Because right now we're not a technology play. And I sort of understand the hesitancy from our business team to want to invest big in the technology, because that's not what we are. We're a content play. We're about good reporting and trying to bring old standards to the digital age. So old school standards, not old standards. Yes? I wonder if you could speak a bit about writing for a global audience. Um, you both are from Boston and from yep. the traditional you know, Northeast Corridor kind of area of journalism. I wonder, that as you've so got a... the way you've said it. <laughs> I, as, you've, as you've got a partnership how with How do the, two white guys from Boston, <laughs> what the hell do they think they're doing right now? Well, and the Times of India partnership really intrigued me. I mean, yeah. that's a huge outlet, but do you write for the Times of India? Do you write for the, the group up in, you know, in the American What we do is we, they run our content. So we write for Global Post. Through syndication, they take the stories. Okay. We, um, we, we are, are really, we love the fact at Global Post that every month, approximately 2.5 million uniques per month, and every month, 200 different countries are coming to the site. Every month. So we're like constantly have almost the whole world every month checking in on Global Post. Um, but we also understand that in the world, there's a lot of international news. And there are great countries with great international news organizations like the BBC. Even, you know, the French documentary teams are amazing. Um, German news magazine investigative reporting is some of the best in the world. The Japanese newspaper wars are legendary, right? I mean, they, they break amazing news. There's so much that's out there in the world, media, that's covering the world, that what we wanted to try to establish was a, was a place that would be open to the world, but that would be very attentive to an American audience that doesn't understand the world very well. It hasn't had the benefit of a news organization that really brings them the world in a big way. I mean, we have great news organizations, LA Times, New York Times. You have NPR. You have these places where international news is done very well. But they aren't as mainstream as the BBC is 
in the world. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't really have an American news organization that has a global presence for international news. You have Voice of America, but it's government funded. Um, we thought, not that the BBC isn't, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an approach that doesn't have the independence, uh, editorial independence of the BBC or the tradition of editorial independence of the BBC. So we thought, how can we create an American voice for international news that's completely inclusive to the world, yet not afraid to sort of have an ear for the music of how America would tell a story? Now, that's not jingoistic or nationalistic at all. We don't want that at all. But we just want to say there's a great tradition of American journalism that we want to be part of. We want to share it globally. We really want to be a global brand, but we want to, we want to sort of curate that American journalism. Uh, and its traditions and its standards, because they are different from many other places in the world. Uh, you know, and I, I would say in many places that I would compare it with, they're better. In some other places, like the UK, for example, I'd say they're better storytellers. They don't bore you as much as our serious media does. BBC knows how to tell a story. That's what makes them great. I wish we had more of that in America. You know, you get it on This American Life, or you get it, you know, in the New York Times Magazine, or you get it in places. You get it here and there. But we don't integrate breaking hard news enough with storytelling in America. And one of the things that was really fun about being from a newspaper the size of the Boston Globe and being a foreign correspondent was that we didn't have to lug around the mantle of history like our friends at the New York Times and the Washington Post. They had to be at every embassy briefing. They had to think about like the big story I was just out looking for a really cool story that I knew the guys I grew up with in Boston would read and go, look where he is now. This is unbelievable. You know, he found that guy from Somerville and he's making subs in the West Bank. That literally happened. There was like a rock throwing incident and I'm covering the Intifada. And I hear this guy making these shawarma sandwiches for all the Shabab, the, the, the youth, Palestinian youth. He's making them sandwiches and he's talking to them. And I'm thinking, this is kind of weird to be giving free sandwiches to kids. It's like encouraging them to get shot at by the Israeli military. I had a sort of bit of an attitude about the whole scene. And I'm listening to him. My Arabic is not that good, so I'm not hearing much, like that dangerous 10% I'm getting. But I swore to God I heard a Boston accent. <laughs> and so I just look at him, and he's standing there behind the stall in, in uh, Ramallah. And I said, hey, where are you from? And he goes, some of them. <laughs> I was right. It's, I said it just the way you'd answer if you, were, if you knew. You, could just, you didn't have to say Boston. You could say where exactly. And he goes, where are you from? And I said, I'm from the Boston Globe. And he's like, get out of here. You know? and so, we, so we start talking about the Red Sox. And so now I got a story that I can bring people into the Intifada. It's not just about Israelis and Palestinians who they may be sick of hearing about. It's now about a guy who owns a great sub shop in Somerville <laughs> named Sammy's. And his real name, you didn't know this, is Samir. And you didn't know his father is Palestinian. And you didn't know that he sees business opportunity in the peace process that just fell apart. And he invested in these sub shops in the place where he's from. And it's all falling apart. And what I thought he was doing was helping kids go out and risk their lives. And actually, he was asking them why there's not a Martin Luther King in the West Bank. That's a hell of a story. That's different than getting the embassy briefing or being given exclusive access you know, to, to Netanyahu because you're the New York Times or you're a big player. And those papers like the Boston Globe, Philadelphia Inquirer, Chicago Tribune, um, they told stories like that because that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to find the local way to get you in. Now, Global Post can't do that because we're we don't have an address, right? I mean, we don't have a zip code that would, that would allow that intimacy. But we wanted to bring a sort of American intimacy to storytelling uh, uh, wherever we can. Most of the time, we're just trying to get the site out every day <laughs> and do the best we can to cover. How about the last quarter of international news? We are all exhausted. Everyone, I'm sure, is very, very angry that I'm out here talking. Right now, and I should be working. Let's take one more question here, and then we'll, we'll take it out of the lobby for a little bit more of a sure. formal uh, thing. Any last questions here? We want to save them for the, for the lobby? Okay. All right, thank you. Thank so much. you. Thanks.